Hey, how's it going? Thanks for watching the video. Thanks for clicking. We really appreciate that. We really hope that you like it. We put a lot of effort into this so that it could help you. Listen, we believe that this should not replace you going to a local congregation, being part of a local church, having a local pastor. Those things are very important, but that this is helping you throughout your week. It's something in addition to maybe you can learn some more. You're trying to see God some more. Then that's awesome. Click like, subscribe, and please share it with somebody. Somebody out there needs to hear the same thing that you just heard. We love you. We hope to see you again. All right, guys, are you ready to eat? Two people. Let's do it. Let's ask again. Are you guys ready to eat? Are you ready for the word of God? Amen. God is about to speak to us tonight. I believe it. I know I know it. God is doing something awesome. Um, I, I feel something different in the atmosphere. God is going to do something awesome. Mm. I feel it. It's strong. So, um, we, uh, sorry, <laughs> you know, God is interrupting, which is good. You know, we make room. We make room so he could do whatever he wants to. Um, so we, we just came out of a series called, uh, Encounter. Encounter. You guys remember Encounter? We talked about what it, what it, what does it mean to have an encounter with the love of Jesus? What does it mean to know the love of Jesus and what it produces in us, right? And so we talked about how a life filled with an experience or encounters and knowledge, like intimate knowledge of the love of Christ, produces in us a life full of the power of God in reality, right? And it produces in us an, an ability to live life with the fullness of the life that comes from God. And a life that is far from fear, right? And, and then later at the end, we talked about the most important part, which is it produces in us a deeper and more passionate love for God, which in loving God more, I encounter more of his love, which makes me love him more. And when I love him more, I encounter more of his love. And therefore, the Christian life all of a sudden is from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from victory to victory, from faith to faith. And um, we, we realize at the end of Encounter that a, a generation that is full of that, full of the fullness of God, complete with all of the fullness of God. Can you imagine a church or a group of people that are, man, we're just full of those. With, with a group of people like that, God can do awesome things, right? God, God can do incredible things with a whole group of people that every single one of them are filled with all of the fullness of God. God can do extraordinary things with a group of people like that. And that brings us into this series. We're going to be talking about something. I want you to say it with me. Awakening. awakening. We're going to talk about awakening. We're going to talk, it's a series. We're in, it's very simple. We're going to talk about what is an awakening. What does it mean? What does it mean for us? What does it look like to experience an awakening? Uh, and so, you know, normally I have chapters or parts in a series, we're going to have ingredients. We're going to have ingredients. Ingredients for an awakening. So I want you to see God as a chef, right? He has his, uh, he has his uh, Chick-fil-A uh, Chick apron on with the little logo on it because it's a Christian company. Um, and, and, uh, and which Brandon also, you know, we love you. You, you work there. Um, where, where's the food, by the way? We need you to bring food next time, okay? Definitely do it. Um, and so God is this chef. He's a cook, and he's preparing this awakening. And so we're going to talk about some ingredients. And so we're going to talk about or, or things that God needs in order to prepare this awakening, in order to cook it up and, and, and make it happen, right? So I want you to say with me today the first ingredient or the first thing that God needs in order to start an awakening is, I want you to tell the person next to you, a dead place. A dead place, a dead place, a dead place. All right, awesome. And so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to pray for our spiritual food. And I want you guys to understand something. I, I will take my time to pray for my spiritual food. Like when God gives me that bread, you know, or, or like how Paul talks about it, like some, like that, that, the steak, you know, 
Uh, it's not really just like milk. We're about to, we're about to eat good. This is going to be like a steak, and it's going to have some side salad and some mashed potatoes loaded, by the way, and some corn on the cob. That's what we're about to take in right now. And so get ready. Get ready for what God is going to do in your life. Um, and so I, I pray for this. And I take my time in doing it, but I want you to understand that when I'm praying for my physical food, I'm quick. In the name of Jesus, Father, bless it. Amen. And I just start eating. Like, that's how I do it. But this spiritual food is so much more important than my physical. This is so much more important. And so that's why I take my time. Because I want to make sure that, first of all, it's not me speaking. I want to honor God and let him have his way tonight. And I also understand that my words aren't going to change your life, but God's words can. My words can't purify you, but God's words can. My words can't transform you, but God can. And so I need, I'm also part of the audience. Like sometimes when I'm up here, I'm like, how did I even, how did that even come out? Like, where did you take that out of God? Because that was not in me. And so I feel like I'm sitting right next to Austin and I'm like, I'm just receiving everything that God is giving us. And I need, I need God to speak to me too. So let's pray. And, and I encourage you, whenever you're going to read the Bible on your daily basis, pray before you do it. And, and ask God, God, before I jump into this, I want it to be more than words on a page. I want it to be you speaking to me and transforming me. Like I want to find you in this scripture. And even if you're reading numbers, it can happen. It can happen. So let's pray. Father in heaven, almighty God, we thank you for the provision you give us of our daily bread. Um, and the clothes on our back. And the roof over our head, Father. But now, Heavenly Dad, we come before you because we're thanking you for the spiritual food you give us on a weekly basis and even on a daily basis. And, and our prayer tonight, Father, is that you would really fill us with your nutrients, that our spirit would really receive what you're trying to, to tell us tonight. So I pray that you would grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you and that you really enlighten the eyes of our understanding. That your word like a seed will really transform, it would take root, it would grow, and it would be strong in our lives that you would produce strong convictions in our lives. And that if any one of us is blind towards a certain thing, open our eyes if there's someone that's heal, that's that's sorry heartbroken, heal them, Father. If there's someone that has fallen, Father, pick them up. If there's someone that is doing something wrong, Father, correct him. If there's someone that's hopeless, fill us with hope. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we thank you. Bless this time that we that we get into your word, and as your word is being exposed, let it produce freedom in our lives. We love you, and we thank you because we're going to find you tonight. As we have been finding it through prayer and through worship, we're going to find you in your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. A dead place. So let's talk about awakening. What is an awakening? What, 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 when Misa says the word awakening, what is it that he's referring to and why is it so important that the whole series is named after it, right? Awakening is, um, let me give you the whole Bible story. This is going to be real quick. Don't worry about it. So you know when Adam and Eve, you know, when they were formed, right? And then you know when they sinned, right? You know when they sinned? <laughs> and they disobeyed God, and, you know, they ate from the, from the, what we, some people think is a pomegranate. Some people think it's an apple, but I think it's a pomegranate. Um, and so, they, they disobeyed God. They ate from the fruit. They sinned. And because of sin, sin when, they, when they disobeyed God, there was three things that entered the world. The first thing that entered the world was sin. The second thing that entered the world was the government and the kingdom of Satan. Satan's kingdom entered the world. That's why we have wars. Right? That's why we have people who steal from each other. That's why we have people who are rioting and burning down targets for no reason. That's why we have racism and hate. But then there's 
there's something else that came into the world with sin and with the kingdom and the and the oppression of the devil came death. Death came into the world. That's why cancer exists now because of Adam and Eve. That's right. That's why that's why all the diseases, all the viruses, that's why COVID-19 exists. Because death entered the world, death was a product a product of sin. And that allows the enemy to come in and say, hey, this is what's going to happen. In fact, Jesus himself in the Bible calls the devil the prince of this age or, or the prince of the world. And so um, that's why we have the term worldliness. We're not talking about people in the world. We're talking about what's over the world, this system that traps you into sin and lures you in into a system of sin and oppression. And so all of these things enter the world, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus says, you know what? I want to save them. Jesus comes and Jesus dies for us and resurrects on the third day providing salvation for us. And so the moment that I give my life to Jesus and I say, hey, Jesus, Lord, you are my Lord and my Savior. I believe in you. Enter my heart and change me, clean me, transform me. The moment that I do that, all of a sudden, even though I was dead, guess what I am now? Alive. Even though death reigned in me, now life is in me. And God gave me new life. The Bible says that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, imagine that. Right, the power that came out of the Holy Spirit and it manifested in him and it rose him from the dead and then it sent him to the heaven. That same power works in you the moment you gave your life to Jesus and continuing on. That's why we get baptized, no? Because we say, hey, you know what? I was dead and now I'm going to be alive. Now I have this new resurrection. I have this new life. So when you hear the word awakening, you should think of, a few other words. You should think of life. You should think of revival. You should think of resurrection. Those are all synonyms to what we're talking about. And so the moment I gave my life to Christ and you gave your life to Christ, you received an individual and personal awakening. You were dead because of sin. And now you have been given new life, right? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Christ, of the, the gift of God is life through Jesus Christ. So we were all dead, and then God gave us new life. So you received an awakening. But here's the thing. You see, this is what the Jews get mixed up with. The reason why the Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Christ is because they are expecting a Christ, a Messiah, an anointed one, a chosen one that would come and once and for all would establish his kingdom and set free the people of Israel, right? And would come in and, and govern and bring light to the world on one visit, one visit, one coming of Jesus. Of the, of the Christ. What they didn't understand is that God intended two comings of Jesus, two, 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 two visits of, G, of the Christ on earth, two of them. Understand this, two of them. They didn't understand that. So when Jesus came, they expected a ruler on a horse with the, with the sword that would set them free politically, right, and then govern and set free and maybe even like affect other the, the rest of the world. But they're like, well, Jesus obviously didn't do that, so that, then he's not the Messiah. What they don't understand is that Jesus is coming again. There's a second coming. He's coming again, and when he comes again, he will surely establish his full kingdom in a very physical and complete way over the entire earth, starting in Jerusalem. That, he is going to do that. But what happens is that if Jesus would have done that the first time he came, and he would have been like, boom, here's my kingdom, and here's my judgment, guess where we all would have been? We all would have been in hell. We all would have been lost forever. So God says, first I need to send my son 
to provide salvation and opportunity for them to repent and come to me and have a personal awakening so that when I leave and that continues going and more and more people believe, when I finally come to establish my full kingdom, right, then at least they had the opportunity. Then at least they all got to hear and they got to choose and I, I offered all of me to them. And many can be saved when I come and I establish my kingdom and my judgment. And so Jesus came once and he bought the salvation, my salvation. And so Jesus entered into my heart, into my life. But I haven't seen his kingdom, his will, 100% fully manifested in my life. Proof. Has my body changed? Do I have a glorified body? Can I float? Can I walk through waters? Or through waters? Can I go through walls? No. But one day, my body will be fully transformed. My soul, my, my, my spirit has received everything that God wants from me. That it is totally remade, renewed. And that's what the Bible says. That is a new creation. It is totally clean. It is totally free. It is completely free of sin. You are 100% pure. And one day, and, and, the, and the process of the Christian life is to transform the soul. And one day, the body will be transformed as well. And so, inside, I received the kingdom of God in my life. Inside, I, the will of God I, I can, it's manifested, and as I pray and as I see God, it's manifested more and more in my life, Right? But the kingdom of Jesus isn't fully on earth yet. So what happens? What happens? Right? The devil was governing. And then Jesus comes in and says, okay, well, I'm going to establish my kingdom little by little in every heart that gives their life to me. Right? And so you joined a group the minute you gave your life to Jesus. You joined a group, and that group is called what? It's called the church. The church. Right? And so the church is filled with the kingdom of God. The church is filled with, with life in God, right? The church has all, every person in the body of Christ has experienced that awakening, that individual, personal, tiny awakening in that individual. Maybe not so tiny. It was big for us, right? And the kingdom of God is in the church but not in the rest of the world, so what happens, right? Jesus has infiltrated the earth, which not really. The devil was on that infiltrated to begin with. But Jesus came in, right, and invaded through the church. And so now there's two kingdoms on earth. Before Jesus died and resurrected, there was only one at a time, right? Adam and Eve were, be, were before they sinned, the kingdom of God was on earth. They sinned, now it's the kingdom of the enemy on earth. And then Jesus Christ dies and resurrects, and now there's two. And so there's a friction between the two. There's a friction. And we Christians call that friction spiritual warfare, right? Where the kingdom of darkness doesn't like the kingdom that's in us. And so we war against it through our prayer, through our evangelism, through our spiritual warfare and our intercession when we are praying we war against it with our lifestyle, with our testimony. We war against it. With our voting sometimes. Or life decisions. We, we war against it with everything that we are. We are light of the world, salt of the earth. And so, what's, what is, and so you can consider us an army. We are an army. You joined a group. You joined uh, the body of Jesus. You joined a family. You joined a community. But you also joined an army. And so as an army, we, we're like these elite special ops, SEALs, Marines, like, like everything put together times 10. That's what we are in the spiritual world. Like we're this elite group of people that we can penetrate the darkness and the devil flees because we have the light of Christ in us, the life of Christ in us, right? And what is the mission of this army? It's to go out in the world and save as many people as we can. And as I preach the word of God to you, 
through my testimony or, 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 or I invite you to my youth group or I invite you to my church and you come and you hear it and then you start to tear up and then you're like, you know what, I want to receive Jesus. Then all of a sudden, boom, an, a, a, another mini awakening in that individual. And so, yes, it's true. That's what an awakening is. It's all of a sudden this resurrection coming from death to life, right, being revived, being resurrected in Jesus. But when we normally, when we refer to an awakening, we're not talking about that individual awakening. We're talking about all of a sudden in history, every now and then, there is a season where there's a lot of little awakenings happening at the same time. Maybe in a, maybe in a street, maybe in a church, maybe in a city, maybe in a, in a region, maybe in a state, maybe in a nation. All of a sudden, like, like there's a season where a lot of people are coming to Christ at the same time. Like, we don't know what's going on, but we're just starting to see the churches start to grow like that. So we call that an awakening, right? It's kind of like this opportunity, this open door, this, this moment, this moment in, in history where God starts to manifest his glory in such a way that so many people start to come to Christ. And it's happened a few times in history. It's happened a few times. If, for example, um, in the book of Acts, after Jesus Christ dies and resurrects, he leaves his apostles. And on the day of Pentecost, a few, not too long after, a few weeks after, or was it? All right. The point is that on the day of Pentecost, the heavens open, tongues of fire fall on each apostle. They start to speak tongues. Different languages that they didn't know, but they were speaking it. And then all of a sudden, right, people start to see and they start to notice. And then Peter stands up because they were making fun of them. And Peter stands up and says, no, we're not drunk. This is what's happening. The glory of God has poured out and you should repent and come to Jesus. And 3,000 men came to Jesus that day. 3,000 men. That doesn't include their wives or children. 3,000 men were baptized on that day. We consider that an awakening. Because a few days after, John and Peter went to a temple called the Beautiful, and then they healed this man, and then they started preaching, and more people gave their life to Christ. They were persecuted for it later, but, and so the devil saw that, and so there here comes the friction. Are you ready? The devil was like, oh, nah, man, this is, this is not good for me. And so he started a persecution. You remember when Stephen died? Right? He was stoned to death, and then that day Paul was present, and he saw that. And he was like, let's go kill Christians. And so many other Pharisees, many other people, they started to like take Christians captive. And then eventually they were led to their death. And persecution began. But what the devil didn't foresee was that when you put the church under fire or under pressure, it only prospers even more. Historically speaking, when the church is persecuted, it prospers. It prospers. You know that one of the, f it, I'm sorry. The fastest growing church in the world right now is in Iran. Is in Iran. Many millions of youth are coming to Jesus in Iran. It's primarily in the youth. They're coming to Jesus. One of the greatest, biggest church that we don't really know all the people that are there because it's an underground church mainly is in China. Millions of people meeting underground, hidden from the government. And so, so I wonder how it is in North Korea. I bet, bet it's like more, way more than we think. And God is going to do something incredible in North Korea, which is, by the way, the most dangerous place to be on earth if you're a Christian. Because you will, they will kill you if you have a Bible or if you preach Jesus. And so th that's what the devil didn't understand. And so... He, he tried to persecute them, but it only made the apostles say, oh, man, we got to get out of here. And they started, like, but that's what God wanted. That's what the devil didn't know. And so they started going to different regions and different places of the world, right? And then Paul was converted, and he started going to all these different places, and many churches were lifted, and many and thousands of people came to Jesus. And then there was an awakening. That was an awakening. And then throughout history, many awakenings have happened for example, the Jesus movement. When my dad was young and my parents were young, like when they were growing up, they were, that was an awakening that happened in Venezuela and South America. It was crazy. So many people came to Christ. So many churches were lifted. 
in, in California during uh, the civil rights movement. We were talking about it before church. During the civil rights movement, there is a man, a black man that started a church in a street in California called Azusa, right? Azusa. And it's, it's, it's called the Awakening of Azusa, of Azusa Street. It was a street. And so this guy started a church in his porch, like in front of the house, like where there was some shade. And it started to grow so much that, the, that he had to move it because the porch was getting like, like it was sinking because it was made out of wood. And too many people were on that porch, so they had to move it. And all of a sudden, that whole street just was filled with people who gave their life to Christ. And it started this amazing revival in California many years ago. Which, by the way, also proves that during that time of persecution, so there was a pain in the world. There was a tribulation, and it only made the church prosper. It was during the civil rights movement. And so... Um, God has said for so long that there's another awakening coming really soon. Like another season where we see a lot of people coming to Jesus. And God has talked so much about this new generation that was going to rise up, and, and, and especially with the youth, right? And that they were going to love Jesus, that it, the churches were going to be packed with youth that love, that search out for Jesus and give their life to Christ. And, and God has been saying it for so long. I'm talking about people who are dead. We're talking about it. Hey, there's something coming. Something coming. It's coming real soon. My dad was one of those people. Hey, something is coming real soon. And we are living in those times. Now. Like we're, we're getting there. I want you to know that the clouds are thick. The raindrops are falling. It's really soon. You can feel it. Many prophets, many pastors, many, many Many ministers of God have been having dreams and have been having visions about an awakening, a huge awakening coming over the earth. And so then all of a sudden, um, my dad in 2015, 2015, he was praying and God spoke to him. Now, God spoke to many other people, and, but I don't know their stories. I just know my dad's. That's why I'm talking about my dad's. But it doesn't mean he was the only one that God spoke to. But God spoke to my dad and said, hey, that's how they talked, right? Hey, um, listen, there's a huge tribulation coming worldwide. Worldwide. Every country is going to be affected by this, this like, it was going to be hurtful. It was going to be painful. It was going to be sad, and it's going to affect the whole world. It's going to affect the economy. And it's going to affect the church. And there's going to be a lot of pain because a lot of people are going to pass away. But then God said to my dad, but the church that stands firm and is aligned with me, because I want you to understand other churches will fall. Some tribulation makes churches prosper. Some other tribulation makes churches if you know what i'm talking about fall and so he says but the churches that really are aligned to me they're gonna they're gonna remain standing and i'm gonna gather those people and i'm gonna use that church i'm gonna use that church for the ne next great awakening that is coming over the earth the next year my dad passes away five years after god told my dad that guess what happened covid19 came and it affected the whole world, it affected the economy, and it affected the church that was closed for a long time. In fact, they're saying that it, it might have to happen again. But that during that pressing, during that fire, right, the churches that remain standing... God was going to use them for a next great revival that's coming. And let me tell you something. You're sitting on that chair, aren't you? Doesn't that mean that you're part of that church? Doesn't that mean that doorway is going to be part of that great awakening? God is going to use us. We just passed through the fire. We might still be very well in it. You're still wearing a mask, aren't you? Right? We're still passing through that. But when we make it, because we will, God is going to do something amazing really soon. Let me tell you something better. 
a long time ago, a long time ago, like all of the, by the way, that was just my dad. There were so many people that had dreams, that had visions, that had like that, that about what was coming to the earth and what was coming to the church. So many people, right? Uh, I think David Wilkerson was one of them, right? The wife of Robert Bandu shared it online. You showed it to me. David, yeah, it was like a pastor named, I think, okay, well, that's not the point. That's not the point. Or was it Rich Wilkerson's dad, right? Whatever. There was a pastor that, like, to the dot, like, he passed away, like, way before it happened, to the dot, he talked about what was going to come over the earth. Hey, I see, like, this great, like, thing coming over the earth, right? You know what I'm talking about? I think it was either David Wilkerson or Rich Wilkerson Sr. Okay, cool. All right, cool. that's fine. All right, so um, a lot of these visions are coming, all of this stuff, and then in the midst of that, in the history, Benny Him, he was like a famous preacher, right? He, he, he said that God had, had him open a whole world map. Imagine a whole world. And that he was going to be blindfolded and where his finger fell, that that was going to be where the next great awakening started. And my dad would always talk about this. Do you want to know where his finger fell? His finger fell in Florida. In Florida. Like, I want you to put everything together, right? How everything, the visions and the, and the prophecies about what was coming and how the church that was going to remain standing was going to be used for a great revival. And at least we know that we're part of that. And guess where we are? What's, what state we are? we're in? Florida. Right? And this is like amongst thousands of other visions that I can't, I don't have the time to tell you. But I want to tell you something that Jesus is coming very soon. Because the second coming of Christ is coming very soon. But before he comes, there's going to be a, a huge awakening that's going to just take a bunch of people. Before he comes again, the rapture comes. Before the rapture, he's going to save us, like all these people. And the rapture is going to come and so many people are going to disappear. I want to prove it to you. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 Verse 14, and we're going to be in the NKJV the whole night. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. I'm going to drink some water. Does anybody need a refresher of the verse? Matthew 24, 14. If you are not there, say, Jesus, help me. Awesome. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So what, what, what is the context about? Jesus was sitting with his disciples and the disciples came up to Jesus and they were like, hey, teacher, tell us, when is that like that, that, that coming? That when are you going to come and establish your kingdom? When is that going to happen? When is the end? How are we going to know that the end is near? And Jesus goes up to them and he's like, all right, guys, so let's talk about this. He says, you're going to know that the end is coming, right? When, um, when you see wars and rumors of wars, he says, a lot of false prophets are going to come in my name. A lot of people are going to say that they're the Christ, that they're the Messiah, but they're really not. That they're the Savior of the world, but they're really not. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be disease. Sin is going to grow so much and love will decay as sin grows. Like the love for other people is just going to die down the more, more and more and sin is going to grow. And i got to ask you a question. Have you during your lifetime, and we're pretty young, have you seen wars? Have you seen rumors? Oh, we've definitely seen rumors of wars, especially World War III. Have you seen disease? <laughs> Hello? COVID, just to name one, Ebola was a big thing, right? We've, or the, or the, the swine flu. Okay, we see many disease. A in other contexts that you, that you can compare with Matthew 24, Jesus also in other contexts talks about like earthquakes and tornadoes and famines. And we've seen that. We've seen that in every, maybe not in the U.S. we've seen famine, but in so many other places of the world we've seen that. We've seen every single sign. We've seen people, false prophets. Hey, this church just went through that recently. False prophets are roaming the world saying, oh, yeah, God told me to say this, but they really didn't. 
the world has seen so many crazy people go up and say, no, I'm Jesus. I'm the Christ, which is like ridiculous. It's like, if you were the Christ, why would you be named Jesus again? Okay, well, whatever. That's not the point. So many people, we've seen every single sign. So we're like, man, Jesus must be really close. Except we haven't seen one sign. There's one sign we haven't seen yet. And it happens to be the last sign that Jesus gives in that list. He says, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in every single nation of the world as a witness to all the world. And then the end will come. That hasn't happened yet. There are nations there are countries that have never heard the name of Jesus. David Platt, right, a, a preaching that I know some of you watched recently. He was talking about the Himalayas. And he was talking about how he went there and he would talk to them. Hey, do you know who Jesus is? And they think that you're talking about some guy who is like next door. They don't know that who, they've never heard of the name Jesus. There are countries, there are nations that have never had access to the Bible because it hasn't been translated to their language. But I want you to know something. Pretty soon, we're close to having the Bible translated to every single language in the world. And the church, more and more churches like David Platt's church or Francis Chan's church, right, and in future, this church, we're going to be sending people to these nations. You might be in one of these nations preaching about Jesus to people who've never heard it. So we know that Jesus isn't going to come yet. Until we see that great revival, that great awakening, right? That we're going to spread the gospel to the whole world. We're going to spread the gospel to the whole world. And so all of a sudden, um, uh, and obviously, again, we're not the only church that has been aligned to God. We're not the only church that's going to be used. Like, hello, there are so many churches out there, like David Platt's church, and like, man, they, they really dedicate themselves to God. And, and to, but, but we are one of the churches, so let's talk about us for a moment. There was a, there was a moment where, um, you know, where I would pray to God in an attempt, in an attempt to be humble, right, and out of fear of being prideful as the pastor of this church. Like, I know that the word is true. And I know that congregating is true. And I know that, that like, we have sound doctrine. But there are so many churches out there that kind of just, like, they, you know, they do it wrong. You know, where they focus on outer appearance, where they judge. It just, they, people, it's, it's oppressive. And so part of that is, you know, these pastors that are, like, these leaders of mega churches. And they're very boastful. And they're very lofty and haughty and proud. And I'm like, God, I don't want to be like that. I would pray to God, and I'm like, God, I don't want to be that guy that has a private airplane when there's so many people starving out there. I was like, God, I don't want to be that church that has 10,000 people. Man, I can't touch 10,000 people. People are not going to even know who I am. I'd rather have, like, 10 smaller churches. You know what I'm saying? Like, put a pastor in each church. Like, I wanted to be, like, humble. I wanted to, you know, that's what I wanted and I don't, but, but in reality, even though I say that it was out of, of fear to be prideful, I know that behind it, that, that was a mask to really just being doubtful and being afraid to get my hopes up for something that I might not see. And then all of a sudden, I'm praying one time about it, and God stops me, and he rebukes me. And he says, Misa, I'm God, and you're human. Let's keep the relationship that way, right? You don't get to tell me how you're going to want the church. I put, you in, I put you as the leader of it, but you submit to me. This is my church. This is my body. And I realized in that moment, I'm like, who am I to go up to God and say, God, I don't want a big church. Who am I to do that to God? God, I don't want you to give me this. I don't want you to give me that because of the, the, the stereotypes behind it. And then I, I was having a conversation with Alain one time, for example, and then he, he, he was, uh, we, were, we were talking about these churches. I mean, sometimes the pastors, they get corrupt or whatever. And then Alain looks, and I was like, God, that, Alain, you see, that's why I didn't want that. And so Alain says, Misa, if God allows that for pastors who aren't doing it right, who are oppressive, who are religious, how much more would he give that to you? And I was like, man, that's true. 
And in that moment, where I was actually showering in that moment, in that moment where God was like, I was like, God, who am I to tell you how you're going to make this church? This is in my, this is yours. And I said, fine, God, do whatever you want. Like, how big do you want it? I'm all for it. And, and I hesitate to share this, but, but I have to do it. Because I want you to know where we're heading. I want you to know what God has placed in our heart. And I say it with a humble heart. And I say it so glad because of I know, I know how that, the, what it means. I know how many people are going to come to Christ through this ministry. So I, I, I say it with that heart in mind. Of think about it with, 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 the, with the mindset of, wow, so many people are coming to Christ. And not because, oh, we're going to be like, you know. God gave me, in that moment, I said, fine, God, do whatever you want. How big do you want it? Whatever you want. You want to give me a plane? Fine, do, give me the plane. I'll go to Africa and feed people. Like, I don't know. Like, I want you to do something. And so then in that moment, God, op- I had a vision. And in the vision, I saw a stadium in Cape Coral. And I was like, wow, God, that's crazy, awesome, awakening. Yes, do it. But that wasn't the, that wasn't the end. The panorama kind of came out, and I remember I, it was like the world. You know how, like, the universal, da, 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 right, like, the, in the beginning of the movies, uh, the universal logo, it's, like, over the earth, the globe. Okay, I saw the earth, like, from a distance. And you know how, like, the Monopoly houses are, like, over the map, you know, the hotels? It was kind of like that, but with, like, with, like, with, uh, with, with stadiums. And I saw the one over in, in Florida, in, like near Cape, like in that in this area. So I was like, okay, that's that's us. And then I saw different stadiums in different continents of the world. And God showed me, oh, you see that? That's a doorway. And I was just, I was mind blown in that moment. I was like, God, I didn't, I didn't think it was gonna be this. This is this is this is way beyond. Like I'm like, this is what you called us for. And when I started to put two and two together, I started to think about all the prophecies that God gave my dad, right, about what God, the ministry he was going to lift up through him. And I'm like, wow, he's not here anymore, and he left us this. That falls on us. And I'm like, that, this is crazy. It was way bigger than what I had ever possibly imagined. But, okay, so, I, so maybe Misa was having, he ate too much that night and something weird and like that's why I had that vision maybe it wasn't God but then all of a sudden my cousin Stephanie has a vision that I was preaching at a stadium and then I, I go and I visit Maria Elena who is the owner of the business next door and she's a Christian she's prayed for me since I was a kid and she said you know Misael I, I never told you this but many years ago so chronologically speaking she saw it first right many years ago I had a vision of you preaching at a stadium and I was like, okay, well, that's pretty cool. So, and then, and then we had guests and visitors come and say, man, I see you guys in a stadium. Like, like, like they had a vision of it. And then my pastor, Alain, comes. And he, he's, he, he was, we were worshiping on New Year's. We were here on New Year's. And he was sitting, like, towards the back. And, and as we were worshiping, he kept hearing, like, so many voices behind him. And he kept looking back. And all he saw was a Stephanie. And he was like, there's no way that girl's making that noise. And, and then the Holy Spirit revealed it to him that we, it was, he, God was showing him like this, this, this vision of a stadium that we were going to be filled with. It's going to be filled with so many youth that were going to be worshiping God. And then Hila's mom comes up to me and says, hey, I had a dream. And in the dream, there was a stadium in this part of Cape Coral, which, by the way, that's a whole other story because I was asking God, God, what about this area? And then she has a dream of that area of Cape Coral that the, that the stadium was going to be there. And she told me the details of the parking lot and everything. I have it recorded on my phone when she, to, when she told me. And none of these people knew that, like, your mom didn't know that she had a vision of me preaching at a stadium. And it's not about me preaching at a stadium. It's about us being in a stadium. That's what I'm talking about. And so I'm like, God, that is amazing. That is so cool. Like, you're going to do it. Like, like that's it, for six people, different people, to have a vision of this, like, this is way too much of a coincidence. I know you're going to do something great. An awakening is coming, and I know that at least we're going to be a huge part of that. A huge part of that. We have a great calling. And it's like, well, Misa, how can you say that? Look at how many years the church has been, and look at the size that you're still. Man, that's exactly why. God 
when God takes his time building something, it's because something great is happening. When you take your time preparing the land and you, pre- and you prepare the foundation of a building, if you're taking many a long time preparing a foundation, it's because that building is going to be enormous. It's God is building something awesome through this church. And it's not for my glory or my pride. Man, that's, that's, first of all, this is like a team effort. Like you're going to be there. We're going to need you, man. We're going to need you. I hope that you're in for it. I hope that you know how to play the drums or something. Like, we're going to need some people to teach the kids. We're going to need some people to, 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 to bring some pizza boxes for youth because a lot of youth are hungry, okay? We're going to need people to help us wipe the floors and stack the chairs and preach. We're going to need people to preach. All right, let's keep going. All right. <laughs> okay, and so, and so all of this together divisions like doorway is chosen to be one of the churches and i'm praying for so many other churches that 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 it's not just us and i know that it's not going to be just us and and we're going to be part of this okay so the visions plus my dad's prophecy plus the fact that the guy pointed over florida like i'm just like hello this is like a lot plus the millions of other stuff i haven't told you and i'm like okay so misa i get it there's an awakening coming and my question is, when you, you can ask yourself, okay, so how is God going to do it, right? Like, we know it's coming. It's definitely going to happen. How is it going to happen? I want to know. What's going to go? How's it going to go down? And so I start to think, I'm like, okay, every time God has done something significant over the earth, every time God has done something awesome and powerful over the earth, how does he do it? And when I start to add it up, you know what? It's the same thing in every single situation in the Bible, every miracle in the Bible, every great thing that happened in the Bible. Do you want to know how it happened? It's through something, I want you to say it with me, uncomfortable. I want you to say it with me, improbable. Say it with me, unlikely. This is how God does it. He chooses the most difficult, the most unlikely, the most uncomfortable and impossible scenario to do that that he wants to do. That's how he starts. And so, okay, so, so let me prove it to you. You ready? You know the story of Abraham? You know, you heard the name Abraham in the Bible at one point? Abraham and Sarah. You know, the dad that almost killed his son. Okay. So Abraham, yeah. So Abraham, um... Okay, so let's talk about that story. So God is like in the heavens. I just imagine God in the heaven and and the Father, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're just there. They're chilling in heaven. And then God is like, you know what? Hey, the Father is like, hey, guys, come on. It's the same God. They, you know, they, but, you know, just bear with me. This is my imagination. And God is like, all right, guys, huddle up. Um, Okay, we... Adam and Eve, they screwed things up, but you know what? Let's let's start up a nation, and through that nation, we're going to bless it. Light of the world is going to be awesome. People are going to know our name. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And the father's like, okay, so we need to pick a man, right, to start this nation. Let's do it through one man, right? We're, through this one family, we're going to start a whole nation that to this day, by the way, is still alive, right, this family. right? We're going to start this family. And then he, they're like, okay, fine, let's start looking over the earth. And then they see, they see little, little John over here and his wife, uh, Betty, right? John and Betty are there, and they're active, and they're young. You know what I'm saying? They're active. No, there's no Netflix. All right. So they, they're active. And, and they have like they have like 10 kids already. And they're like 30. That's active. They're like 10 kids in. And, and God, they're like, hey, man, they're fruitful. They're young. Huh? How about them? Right? Michael and Gabriel are like, those guys, those are good choices, my Lord. And God, right, the 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 the, the Trinity, they he, they. He's like, nah, that's too easy. No, I need, I need something more uncomfortable. I need a challenge. I need the impossible. I'm not a God of the easy. I'm not a God of the capable, the things that are possible. Right? I'm the God of that too because I made the possible. Like I want, I'm the God of the impossible. Impossible is my middle name. And so then he finds a man who is 75 years old, his wife is like 65, plus she's barren. She can't have kids. And God is like, perfect. To make, it, to make matters worse, he goes up to them and he says, hey, I'm going to give you a son. Leaves 25 years later. 
Okay, here you go. So now Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is like 90 years old. Her womb is, in, is a raisin, is, is wrinkly, and she has a son. And through that one son, God started a nation that is now called Israel. And today, they have generations and generations that still live. Why? Why couldn't you use John and Betty? Why did you have to use Abraham? Let's talk about uh, later the, the people of Israel, they become a nation. And then God is like, well, now they're slaves in Egypt. Michael and Gabriel are like, man, what are we going to do? And God is like, I got it. We're going to set them free. And so if God would have been like, hey, Misa, come here. Misa, come here. And I'm in heaven. And God is like, hey, listen, um, what do you think? Like, we want to set them free. What would your plan be? This is what Misa would say. Misa would be like, well, my Lord, <laughs> I think this is what I would do. You know, like the people of Israel are millions of people, but they're all slaves. You know what I would do at night when they're sleeping? Send an angel to each home, an angel to each home. And when they wake up in the middle of the night, they're like, oh, who are you? And they're like, hey, don't worry. I'm, I'm an angel. I came from Jehovah. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a God. I'm God's servant. Listen, um, God sent me to tell you God is going to set you free. This is the night we're going to take over. So here you go. Sword for you, sword for you, sword for you. And then let me touch you. And then touches their chest. And all of a sudden, their muscles, like, they just get ripped. All the calories are lost. Well, actually, they were like slaves, so they probably didn't have any. But, like, like they just get, like, totally toned. And they're like, let's go now. And so the, plus the angels, right, they just go and take over Pharaoh and, like, the people of Israel. That's what I would do. I know that I have you. I told you guys I have a creative mind. That's what I would do. And God is like, well, thanks for your opinion, but I have something better in mind. What if none of them use a sword and I give one guy a stick, a wooden stick? And, I, and we're, well, Lord, what, what man? Who's going to have that privilege? And God starts roaming the earth. He starts looking at the earth. And then he sees a man who is considered to the people of Israel a traitor and to Egypt, a criminal and a murderer who fled to the desert to save his own skin. And God is like, that guy. That's the most uncomfortable, impossible, improbable, unlikely situation. I want to use him. His name was Moses. Why, God? Why? Let's keep going. Then the people of Israel are being oppressed all of a sudden one day. You know, I, I, keep, I keep mixing this up. I don't know if David happened first or Gideon, but that's not the point. Right, one time, what? Gideon, so, okay, I knew it. All right, so one time the people are, are, they become a nation, they're set free, whatever, right? And so they're there, and they're shifting wheat, but then there's a, there's a, there's a nearby land of, 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 of just, just like jerks, right, that keep coming and keep stealing their food. Their harvest, their hard work. They, they're oppressing them, and they come with horses and sword, and they're like, hey, give me your food. They're bullies. And God is like, man, I'm tired of these jerks taking advantage of my people. So God is like, all right, let's go. Let's gather around, guys, all the angels. And God is like, who are we going to choose? We're going to lift up an army. And the Holy Spirit is like, I found somebody. You know how, well, you know, in the wine press, it was like this hole in the ground. And they would, you know, where they would squeeze the grapes with their feet. And, you know, they like, they would make the wine later on. It was like this, this ditch in the floor, this like hole. And Gideon was like really afraid because he was sifting wheat. And to sift wheat, you have like this net and you throw up the wheat, right? And the wind, like the wind blows away the, uh, the straw and the wheat is heavy. And so it would fall, and it wouldn't be taken by the wind. And so you have to keep going like that, and then the, 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 the straw is taken away, and the wheat falls, and that, like that you, like, you sift it. You sh what? Shaft. The shaft. You use the shaft. You shaft it. What? Oh, the shaft. The shaft is what falls away. I'm sorry. I don't know where you're talking. I'm sorry. All right. So he's there. He's in this hole, and he's like, he's doing that. But he, here's the problem. You need wind to do that, and he's in this hole. Mike Todd was preaching about this one time, and he was, he was probably like, he was trying to blow on it like with, with his breath. That way the shaft could, could go. 
And then the whole, then all of a sudden God reveals himself to Gideon and says, Gideon, brave warrior. And Gideon's like, what? And he's like, yeah, you, you're the leader of this army. This guy that's totally afraid. So he gathers, he musters up this army of thousands of men. All right, let's do this, guys. God told us. And God is like, hey, Gideon, come here, come here. He says, hey, listen, that's too many guys. Get rid of them. Get rid of a lot of them. And Gideon's like, <sighs> he goes, he gets rid of them. And then he comes back. He's like, all right, is this enough? And God is like, nope, still too much. And he starts to cut their army into 300. Just 300 men were left. Like the original 300. Not like, you know, that movie with Gerard Butler. Like this is like the original. They, that's a rip off to this. 300 men. 300 men. They go and then how they did it is a whole other crazy story. And I'm like, why do you do it like that? And we don't have a lot of time. But if you look at David's story, the youngest of a family that's not known. By the way, he was a pastor. He had the job nobody wanted. In a, in a city that wasn't really known at all. It wasn't really loved by many. Like, it, Bethlehem was like, was like Cape Coral. It was just field. Cape Coral in 2004. It was just field. It was nothing. Nobody wanted to be in Bethlehem. And God is like, I need a king. Bethlehem. Family that's not really known. Youngest one who is a pastor. You, I want you. You're, you're going to be the next great king. You look at Solomon. You look at how Jesus came to earth. How did Jesus, something great, the biggest miracle of all eternity. And God is like, man, now this is the biggest thing, bigger than Moses, bigger than Noah, bigger than Elijah, bigger than everything. I, I God, am going to come in the flesh, in the form of a man. And in my opinion, if God would have asked me, hey, how do I direct this? How do I do this? Like, give me your opinion. I would have been like, you know, have you ever seen Terminator? He's in Terminator. Okay, I would have been like, all right, so, so check that out, right? All of a sudden, this lightning bolt, like huge lightning bolt, right? And then this guy comes up from the ground, and he's just like, I'm here to save the world, right? And he's like this jacked guy, like, I'm here to save the world, like, dead alive, like, leper, leprosy gone, blind are open, like, blind, blind lighters are open, and it's just like lame walk, and he's just like, yeah, power. When he touches people, just like lightning, and people are healed. Like, that's what I would have imagined God being, becoming flesh. And God is like, well, thank you for your opinion. But I'd rather come as a little baby in a town that nobody likes, Bethlehem, right? And I'm going to choose this little virgin girl. She's a teenager. They're not even married yet. Like, am, am I, I'm like, God, at least get them married you know, prevent a, sca a sex scandal or rumors of fornication. God is like, no, I want to make this uncomfortable. And then he grows up in Nazareth. What, who, what, you, Nazareth, you, this is how bad Nazareth was like, not liked. Nazareth, when, uh, when uh, Nathaniel's brother comes up to Nathaniel, he's like, hey, Nathaniel, listen, man, we think we found the Christ, like the Messiah, like he's here. And Nathaniel's like, what? We've been waiting for this guy for like ever. What's his name? And then he says, Jesus of Nazareth. You, the Bible quotes Nathaniel when he's like, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good? Can you imagine how bad of an of a, of a area it would have to be for you to say, man, nothing good could come out of Nazareth? They would have thought Jerusalem, which a.k.a. like to them was like Washington, D.C. Or like New York. They would have thought it would have came from like a Pharisee family, a rich, influential family. Nope. People, two people that were poor, they didn't even know, and, and they weren't even married, and she was a teenager. That's who God chose. And you see it all over the Bible. You see it all over the Bible. God chooses the most unlikely way to do something. And so let's bring it back to topic. Actually, let's not bring it back to topic. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. I need you to read this. I need you to read this. We need to chew quickly now. 1 Corinthians 1, 27.
It says in 1 Corinthians 1.27, it says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. So let me explain it like this. You need a, you need provision. Like God is like this like Russian agent. You know how like you, you watch the show. I've been watching Blacklist lately, and like there's people that have like these different passports with like different names on it, right? And whenever they need, they need to be whoever they are. Like they choose to like, oh well, I'm gonna go to Russia, so I need to use this passport. And they have like these aliases. In a very weird way, God is somehow similar. God, God's name, Jehovah, means the one who is, the one who exists. And I love that because that's his first name. But he has a lot of last names. And so when Abraham is like, you're going to put it, you're going to make me have a baby? This is impossible. And God is like, give me one second. He, he looks through his passports, right, his IDs, and he's like, okay, I got it, I got it. I am Jehovah El Shaddai, meaning I am God, the one who can do all things. You're like, man, Jesus, I don't, ah, man, I don't really have enough finances. And God is like, give me one second, man. And he's looking through his passport. He's like, oh, here you go. I am Jehovah Jireh, the God who is my provider. Jireh means my provider or our provider or provider. And so God says, hey, I provide. And so whatever situation, what is it that you're going through? What need do you have? That, whatever the solution to your problem is, that's God's last name. Whatever solution to the problem you're facing right now, that is God's last name. I need to quote that. Remind me. Whatever so, I'm going to say it again. Whatever, so, whatever solution to your problem is, that is God's last name. God is the solution to every problem. He is the source of every single thing that you need. It's his last name. And what's pretty cool is when you put all those names together, you get one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, all of the promises of the Old Testament are provided to you. Jehovah Nisi, the God who is my banner of victory. You need victory. You're failing on something. There's victory. That's God's last name. And so when we bring it back, now we're bringing it to topic. When you talk about an awakening, right, we're talking about the first ingredient. This is the, this is the, 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 the pan that God cooks, the pan that God needs in order to make in the, 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 you know, the ingredients of an awakening. The, what God needs is a dead place. You see, God is attracted to, to dead things. I want you to know that. God is attracted to dead things. He likes it. He, he wants to go to it. He's like, oh, you see that, man? I can't help myself. God is, it's like gravity to him. Like he can't help but be drawn to things that are dead because the thing is that God's last name, another one of his last names is life. He is called the living God. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life in abundance. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, God is life. And when there's death, when something is dead, when there's a place that's dead, God is like, ooh, you bet I'm coming. And God is like, ooh, that's a, cha- ooh, a challenge. There's no challenge for God. But God is like, yes. And the deader, <laughs> that's not a word. The more dead, the deader it is, the more God is going to be glorified. Why does God choose uncomfortable things? Because it brings him more glory. You see, it's already an impossible situation. He might as well have fun with it and make it more impossible. And so when it comes to an awakening, for you to need awakening or revival or resurrection is because something is what? Something's dead. And God, whenever it comes to awakening, God shows up and he's like, what's up, man? I am life. And he brings life to everything that he touches. That's how God starts an awakening. You start with a dead place. You start, that's the pan that God cooks it in. You start with a dead place. And God, you, let me prove it to you that God is attracted to dead places. Are you ready? When Jesus Christ, God in flesh, was on earth, right? There was not a single funeral that Jesus went to where the person didn't resurrect. And guess, guess what? Including his own. There wasn't a single burial that Jesus was a part of that the person didn't resurrect. 
Jesus is walking and he sees a widow and her son, her only son died. Can you imagine the situation? A widow and her only son died. She's going to be alone. And she's weeping and crying and there's a whole bunch of people and there's these pallbearers and they're carrying the boy, right? And Jesus is like, puts his hand over the boy and they stop and they're like, who is this guy touching my boy, right? And Jesus says, wake up. And the kid gets up. And then later, Jairus, Jairus comes up. He's a Pharisee, but he doesn't care at this point that he's talking to Jesus. He's like, I need you. My 12-year-old daughter is dying. And Jesus is on his way, right? And they're running. They're running to the daughter. And then Jesus is like, like, he gets interrupted by this lady with the flow of blood. And he's like, give me a second, Jairus. And Jairus is like, my daughter's dying. Right? And so he, he heals this lady. He's like, all right, let's go. And then right when they're done, the, Jairus gets word, your daughter is dead. Bury hope. There's no more hope. Bury it. That's it. Give up. Oh, man, there's something that you buried. There's, so, there's a hope that you left because it's not, you thought it wasn't going to happen anymore. Let me tell you something. God never comes late. And even if, you, if he comes late in your time, he actually was right on time. And when he gets to the little girl's room, she's already dead. And Jesus says, Talita kumi, girl, get up. And the girl resurrects. And then Lazarus, we already know the story of Lazarus. Lazarus come out and Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Four days dead. And then Jesus dies. And Jesus gets resurrected. And this is the cool, this is something so cool. When I didn't, I didn't, I forgot this detail until Huvet shared it with me. When Jesus Christ resurrected, did you know that there was a bunch of graves that opened and people were resurrected with him? A bunch of people. The power that was manifested upon Jesus' resurrection was so strong that a bunch of people around Graves just started to open up. It was like zombie land, man. And they just came up and people were resurrected. It was awesome. Because God loves to bring dead things alive. God likes to make the dead things come to life. He, that's his passion. And every single time somebody gives their life to Christ, that's an awakening. That's something dead coming to life. God's attracted to it. He wants to. He, he just can't help himself but to make dead things come to life. And for me, in my life, I experienced no deader place than the city of Cape Coral. And all of a sudden, there's a church that's born here that's called to be part of a great awakening in the state of Florida. Do you see the, are you adding all the things up? And out of all the city of Cape Coral, do you know that, out, out of Florida, do you know that Cape Coral was the, 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 the nickname people gave Cape Coral, that Christians gave Cape Coral? They told my dad this, this is where pastors bury their churches. Right? Cape, Cape Coma, you heard that one? Cape Coma? Like, this is just dead. People hated. They still, some people still hate Cape Coral. They don't like it. And God is like, I'm going to start an awakening in Florida. I need a dead, I need a real dead place, Cape Coral. So let me send one of my greatest ministers, like known in different nations, and I'm going to have him open a little tiny small church. And once it's getting going, I'm going to take him away. And I'm going to lead the next generation to keep going. And that's called Doorway. And that's you and that's me. God is doing something awesome, and you are a part of it if you want to be. This is going to be awesome, and, and I'm so excited because if God is bringing this series now, that means that it's at the cusp. We're feeling the raindrops. I want you to get up with me. Let's stand up because I need, I need to land this plane. And let's not do the lights yet. Let's keep him, and then I'll signal at you. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, God sends Ezekiel, a prophet in the Old Testament, to do something crazy. It says, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which, by the way, biblically speaking, valley always talks about death or sadness or darkness or difficulty. For example, I shall, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Okay, so he sends him to a valley. But it's not just any valley. It says it was full of bones. It was full of bones. Imagine going to a valley and it's this dark place and there's a bunch of bones scattered around his graveyard. 
And then he caused me to pass by all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. I want you to say it with me out loud, very dry. Do you know what this means? This wasn't just some graveyard. This wasn't just some people that had died recently. Like God was like, I want you to go to the valley and I'm going to, bone, the bones, I want to make sure to explain to you through the Holy Spirit that it was very dry. And the drier it is, the better it is for God's glory. And he says, it is very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And bones started rattling and they came together in flesh, right, in muscles and bone. And it, it all just came together and the people were resurrected. And God was talking about a resurrection and awakening to come later on for the people of Israel. But he was also talking about something even greater. So tonight, we're gonna, we're gonna, now we're going to turn off the lights. And we're going to declare something together over the city of Cape Coral. And I want, you, I want you to, like, lift up your hands as high as you can. And I want you to know something. Maybe because some of you live in Fort Myers. I, I want you to understand something. If we start a fire, spiritually speaking, in Cape Coral, guess what's going to happen to Fort Myers? It's going to catch it. And then guess what's going to happen to Estero and Bonita, right? And, and North Fort Myers and Lehigh, it's going to catch it. And a whole, that's why Florida, Florida is going to be filled with the, and then from Florida it's going to catch it in the rest of the U.S. And from the U.S. we're going to go to other continents. All right? All right. So I want you to declare, I want you, we're going to start a fire tonight in Cape Coral. That's later going to spread, right? I want you to lift up your hands. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to really, like, say this as loud as, I want, to, I want, to, I want it to be rude. I want you to say it out, that the demons can hear it. I want, I want principalities to hear this. Let's, let's declare this. In the name of Jesus, we declare now over Cape Coral. In the name of Jesus, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. In the name of Jesus, amen. And amen. Give God a shout of praise right now. We declare awakening. We declare revival. It's coming in the name of Jesus. From the living God. In the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen.